morning and welcome to our service this morning. We're going to begin by standing as we sing, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. This is one of my favorite hymns. Heaven came down. Good to see everybody here this morning. Thank you for joining us here in person as well as online. I especially want to thank those who are visiting. If you are here today for the very first time or the first time in a long time, thank you for being our guest. Um, in, your, in, in the lobby as well as at, at every exit, there's a welcome packet. If you would, take one of those welcome packets before you leave today, fill it out, and then drop that visitation card that's inside that welcome packet in our offering box that's located in the back of our auditorium here. Again, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, just a couple of reminders. Vacation Bible School is underway. We had a, a good turnout. Uh, basically, we're, we're focusing on family and friends of the church, and so thank you for those who have um, come and helped. And then uh, tonight, we have a uh, BCA, Berea Christian Academy, recognition, as well as gra a graduation rec graduates recognition service, and uh, um, that's 5.30 this evening if you care to come. And then July the 19th, after the morning service, there will be a music ministry meeting. Anybody who's interested in participating in any part of the music ministry is encouraged to attend. We'll, we'll tell you more about that and remind you next week. 
And again, if you want to recite memory verses in the month of July, uh, let me know, and we'll have someone posted at the Welcome Center, the, uh, the piano studio room, where uh, you can recite the verses. We'll sign off on it. You get one help or one mistake per verse. And again, just trying to challenge you to put the Word of God in your heart. We'll do that in the month of July, all right? So uh, take, that, take advantage of that opportunity to be challenged in Scripture memory. All right, at this time, we have our Scripture memory verse of the month here. It's uh, the classic um, verse that teaches us that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone and not of work. So we'll say the reference together, the verse and the reference. Ready? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you with thanksgiving. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we have a place to come. We have a reason to come. Lord, you are our God. You are our maker. And we are the people of your pasture and the sheep of the sheepfold today. Lord, we ask that we would hear your voice, that you would speak to us, that we would not harden our hearts. And we ask, Lord, that uh, we would draw near, that you, that you give us your word that... Uh, that we might obey. You say your word is not grievous, but it's good for us. And so, Lord, forgive us of our disobedience, our ingratitude toward the word of God. Lord, you've magnified your word above all your name, as you've said in the Psalms. And Lord, help us to treat your word with great reverence. Help us this morning to put away every false idol, every distraction, every thing that would come into our mind as we uh, focus upon the word of God. Help us to draw near. Help us to have purity of mind and of body. We ask that you would open up our hearts and minds to your truth this morning. Illuminate our minds with your holy wisdom from your holy word. And as we think of our country, Lord, we pray for the president. We pray for his cabinet, for all that are in authority. We pray that we may lead quiet and peaceful lives in all godliness and honesty. We pray that you would bless our country, the land of our forefathers. We pray that you would send upon our national leaders, our state leaders, our local leaders. We pray that you would give them wisdom, prudence courage and strength that they may govern and exercise the rule of law with all wisdom that all citizens may live in peace and we ask for ourselves help us as believers to be faithful and courageous as we stand for the truth in this generation lord we think of uh, those servants of yours our, the missionaries that we support and other missionaries around the world we pray that you would strengthen your servants in every land to be faithful to be true to be bold for Christ and his cause, that your church, in the, in, in the strength of your power, may be able to stem the tide of unbelief. Help us, Lord, to win the lost, to bring back those who have gone astray. Lord, we think of our own, uh, Pastor Ted, Daddy Philippi, um, Lynn Letzring, recovering or needing recovery from health. We pray, Lord, for those who are hurting in sickness or in sorrow, that out of your loving kindness, out of your healing hand and your healing touch, because you are the great physician, we ask you to send them comfort and help. We thank you for your great love in sending us your son. So help us, Lord, to be as he was. Help us to seek and to save the lost like Jesus did. We pray that Jesus would be magnified in all that we say and all that we do. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's stand once again as we continue on with our song service, O Great God of Highest Heaven, Occupy My Lonely Heart. Let's sing it. Oh.
Our scripture reading for this morning is found in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Follow along as I read. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. As we go to prayer this morning, uh, we want to remember the Sheloshenkos in France. Um, we haven't received anything new from them lately, but you might check the uh, missionary display out in the foyer uh, to see what um, prayer letters might be posted out there from them. But we need to continue to pray for them as, as they minister in France and as J.J. Uh, deals with his long-growing cancer. And we just praise the Lord along with him that the Lord has kept him around these many years and for the opportunities he's had to minister to doctors and nurses and other folks there in France. Let's go to prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for another day that we can assemble in this place that you have provided. We thank you for your love and mercy and grace in each one of our lives. And we look to you for guidance and direction in these troubled times that our hearts and minds might be stayed upon you, upon your word, and that we might be the witnesses and testimonies throughout our community as you would have us to be. We do pray for JJ and Valerie and the children as they minister there in France. Pray for the other missionaries that we support as well, that they would, you would continue to give them good health, give them um, power for their ministry, that they might see your word uh, taken to heart by those that they minister to. And for us here in Palm Harbor as well, that you would give us opportunity to speak to those round about us, that uh, it is so easy to be mindful at this time of what your word says about the last days. And we think that a lot of people are wondering about that. And may we use that as an opportunity to minister to their hearts and minds. May you give us peace and comfort as we endeavor to live for you and be the, the people that you would have us to be as we can endeavor to love one another and love those around us. All these things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
this time, we're going to dismiss our junior church. So our first through fifth grade can uh, head out the door for our junior church there. And we're going to sing our final song of this morning. This is a song that I actually have never heard about before. And so uh, I'm sure many of you have. So let's stand as we sing A Passion for Souls. Give me a passion for souls, dear Lord, a passion to save the lost. And let's sing out.
Josh and Emily for that ministry of music. Um, let me invite you now to turn, to turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, we're returning to our verse-by-verse -verse study of the Gospel of Luke. This morning's sermon is entitled, Zacchaeus, A Changed Life. Um, before I get into the illustration at the beginning here, how many of you have ever been lost in a department store, mall, amusement park, or a zoo. Anybody ever been lost? How many of you had had a child <laughs> lost in one of those, or a grandchild? Okay, so, uh, you know, funny story, scary. Scary at the beginning, right? But did you know uh, the reason that we as Christians, we don't do more evangelism is that we've lost our concern for the lost. Most people, as well, are not concerned that they are lost. They're like the little boy at Disney World who was enjoying Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. He was enjoying the Ferris wheel and the roller coasters. He was having a marvelous time and in the midst of the crowd got separated from his parents. When he got separated from his parents, he didn't know that he was lost because he was having so much fun on the rides. Satan has so constructed this world order to give you enough distraction so that you don't know you've gotten lost in your spiritual Disney world. We've got a world full of people who don't know that the fun in this world and all this world is offering them, you know, the movies, the parties, the clubs, the social relationships, the money, the jobs, can be satanic camouflage to keep them from realizing that they've been separated from the love of God. Mankind spends so much time having fun that they don't know they are lost. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the, the pleasures of this life have blinded them to their need of a relationship with God. However, this kid's parents, this particular child, they were looking for him. They knew he was lost at Disney World. They went to an officer and told the security and they, that they couldn't find their child. The security men led the parents to the lost child who, again, still didn't even know that he was lost. Did you know God wants to find lost people? You and I, we're the security guards to bring lost people to the Heavenly Father. That's our task in evangelism. We're the ones that God has chosen to deliver this message to bring people to a relationship with their creator. In our scripture text this morning, we see Jesus doing just that, delivering the message of salvation to a man named Zacchaeus. And from then on, we see the result of a changed life. Zacchaeus, a changed life. Luke 19, beginning in verse 1, we'll read verse 1 to 4. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. 
And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. So we see the beginning of a changed life here. Jesus will meet with Zacchaeus. Um, Zacchaeus is a sinner. He is a wealthy tax collector. His name, Zacchaeus, means righteous one or pure one. His parents must have had high hopes for them when he was a child. I also imagine that uh, he was also teased as a child, right? Oh, you're the goody two-shoes. You're the, you're, you're the righteous one, the pure one. By the time he was adult, an adult, he was far from the righteous one. In the eyes of his Jewish brethren, he was a traitor. Politically, financially, he was a traitor. He was despised. He was not allowed into the synagogue to worship. Yet he was rich. It says here that he was chief among the publicans. He was the supervisor or leader in charge of tax collectors. He had tax collectors under him. He was the main guy. He was a publican, hated by his own people. He collected taxes for a foreign government. And because that, basically a tax collector bought a tax franchise from the government, from Rome. Rome would require a base amount, and anything over that was profit. And therefore, these tax collectors could gouge and increase their profit margin. And so they were considered as political traders, financial traders. And this place, where he was this chief among the tax collectors, publicans, was at Jericho. It was a major highway and trade junction. It was a resort for royals. It was the Israel's version of Las Vegas. Okay, there is the, the, this is the last major stop for pilgrims headed from the north down to Jerusalem, 18 miles away from Jerusalem. This is Sin City. Bathhouses, pools, hippodrome, amphitheater, money, sin coming from every direction of the compass met here in Jericho. Yet here, this chief tax collector, he was, he was you know, in charge of the tax funnel. A lot of money passed through this city, and he was the chief. And so he, you know, the rich young ruler we read in Luke 18, the man, remember what, what Jesus told him to do? Sell everything that you have, give to the poor, come and follow me. He didn't do it. He turned away from Jesus because he had many riches, had many rich things. Here, this man is filthy rich, richer than rich. Yet he would endure the scoffing from his own people, not only for his height probably, but also for his position and his profession. He was a sinner, but he was also a seeker. According to verse 3 and 4, he heard that Jesus was going to pass by. He desires to meet Jesus, but there's a problem. You know, those who've been taxed by him, you know, there's a crowd gathering. And again, this is towards the last week of Jesus' life. There is a messianic crowd, people from the north, northerners, supporting Jesus and his ministry, Jesus and his kingship. They're moving down from the north, from Galilee now. They're 18 miles away from Jerusalem. They're entering into Jericho here, and there, there is a, quite a stir So we have Zacchaeus, the seeker here. He desires to meet Jesus, but this problem... There is a big problem, okay? This was probably not the first time Zacchaeus heard of Jesus. He would sit with royalty in Jericho. He would sit with Roman dignitaries and officers. Who's who among Jericho knew who Zacchaeus was? You know, he was living the lifestyles of the rich and famous. So he had heard news about this miracle worker, this teacher of strange doctrine, this famous rabbi. He may have been friends with a man named Levi. Levi was also a tax collector. He was also an apostle who left his own tax collector business to follow Jesus full time. So here is Zacchaeus desiring, seeking, he sought out to see Jesus because something was happening. He had built up a curiosity about this man. He had heard some of the teachings, most likely. What teachings? You ever heard the saying, what should it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Okay. Teachings like that. Teachings about money. Teachings about, wait, a tax collector left his profession? And if he knew the man, that was even more significant. 
He had everything that money could buy, but something was missing. Wealth did not satisfy him. He was empty inside. The things of this world did not satisfy. Yet he was interested in this Jesus, and he was open to change. But there was a problem, and the source of his problem was he was a shorty. He was too short. You know, politically, he was vertically challenged. <laughs> There's a crowd around Jesus. You know, if, he, if they didn't like Zacchaeus, they didn't care, you know. I'm not letting you in. You know, he would get elbows and hips, get out of my way. You may own our money, but you don't me. So get behind me, right? And so he could not get in to see Jesus because of the press. The crowd was pressing in on Jesus. And so I like Zacchaeus, at least his attitude. You know, if, if, if life deals you lemon, make lemonade. So he couldn't see. So what did he see? He foresaw. He looked down the road, saw a tree, a sycamore tree, a fig tree. And apparently the, the fig tree, or the, the sycamore tree, short in trunk, so lower branches, thick and sturdy. He's able to climb up this tree. He solves the problem that he had. Probably, you know, not wishing to be seen, but either way, he didn't care. You know, grown men don't climb trees. He didn't care about the dignity or the shame. He climbed the tree. He was little of stature, so he got where he could position himself to hear Jesus. Now, let's look at verse 5. Zacchaeus the seeker becomes Zacchaeus the sought. Verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. So what do we have here? The seeker now becomes the sought. Jesus sees. And we see the Savior's request here. Basically, quick, come down. I have to be a guest in your home today. It's the first time that Jesus ever invited himself to somebody's house. This would be the last time there would be a personal encounter with the public before the week of his passion. It's as if Luke, in his narrative, is building. Jesus preaches to the masses. Jesus teaches the, the religious, rebukes the religious. He heals the, the, the sick. He rebukes the rich. He causes the blind to see. And now, in his last personal interaction, a rich man will get saved. Do you remember what Jesus said to the rich young ruler in Luke 18? Okay, sell everything you have, give to the poor, follow me. He turned away from Jesus because he had many riches. And then the, the, the apostles' question to them was, if a rich man can't be saved, how can anybody be saved? And Jesus, you know, because their theology was, God blesses the rich. So if you're rich, it's because God blessed you. That was their theology. And so here we have Jesus responding to the disciples' consternation, their surprise and their shock. How can rich men not be saved? Jesus says, you know, it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Okay, in other words, virtually impossible for a rich man who trusts in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. And then he said after that, with men it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And guess what? Here's that all things that are possible this rich man is going to get saved. What happens? The Savior's request, come down. You know, you, you know the song, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up on the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed on by, he looked upon the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, what's the next word? You come down for I'm coming to your house today. So Jesus is asserting himself making this last personal interaction because Jesus cares for individuals. Jesus cares for the lonely. Jesus cares for the drunkard. Jesus cares for the tax collector who's despised because Jesus loves the lost. So he invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. And the tax collector, Zacchaeus' response, you know, he says, make haste. He makes haste. He gets down, receives Jesus gladly, 
And we see the crowd's reaction in verse 7. And they saw it, and they all murmured, saying this, that he has gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. They didn't understand, you know, from God's viewpoint, every house that Jesus goes into is the home of a sinner. For all have sinned. So in going to dinner with Zacchaeus, Jesus showed his, his dedication, his love for seeking and saving the lost rather than catering to the criticism of the, of the crowd, of the religious establishment, the self-righteous. Now let's look what happens as Zacchaeus the seeker turns to Zacchaeus the sought, and now in verses 8 and 10 we see Zacchaeus the saved. Verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, oh, by the way, between verse 7 and 8, we don't know how much time has passed. Whether they just had dinner or he stayed overnight, we don't know how much time has passed, but a lot of conversation probably passed by. He probably threw a party. Matthew, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew, whose name was Levi, who was a tax collector, probably caught up with some of his tax collector friends. It says in verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood... And said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So we see Zacchaeus the saved here. As witnessed by his own testimony, he says in verse 8, I'm going to give half my money to the poor. And if I've stolen anything, I'm going, to, I'm going to pay back fourfold. Okay, he goes, he does what the law requires in regards to restitution, a fourfold restitution. David paid that restitution. This man who was once driven, controlled by the love of money, is no longer worshiping money. He turned to Jesus from the love of money, from idols. He loved money once more than he loved man. Now, he loved God and man more than money. He's been changed. He gave outward evidence of an inward change. Repentance came in the form of action in his life. He had a new lifestyle. He had a new Lord. There was a new CEO, new management here in his heart. Jesus is now on the throne of his heart. He's been changed. His life has been rearranged. And the evidence of that changed life is that money has been no longer on the throne of his heart. What a difference it's made here. Since the Lord came and stayed in his home and now... In his heart. Zacchaeus' repentance is seen in his changed life. He became an honest man who paid back who he cheated. What a great change. Salvation doesn't cancel your debts to men. In fact, salvation guarantees that you will pay restitution. The Apostle Paul would write in this way owe nothing to any man except to love him. So pay back your debts. And that's what he did. What a difference it made in his life. What a change. What a great change that when Jesus comes, there is going to be a change. There are many in the United States, in the churches of America, who say that they have Jesus as Lord and Savior. Their lives have not been changed because they've lacked this element. The first half of the gospel, repent and believe. There is no repentance, no turning to God from sin. Faith in Jesus, a wholehearted commitment is a wholehearted confidence that Jesus breaks the chain of every addiction. That Jesus loosens the bond of every addiction, whether it be financial addiction to the love of money or love of whatever else you can put in that place. Jesus breaks the chains, He sets men free. He changes men's lives, and he's still seeking to change the lives of thieves, of drunkards, of adulterers, murderers, and every other type of sinner. 
He has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And we see here by his own testimony, Zacchaeus' own testimony, that a change has been made. And let me just say something as an aside here. You know, a skeptic may deny our doctrine. He may even attack your church. But he cannot honestly ignore the fact that your life has been cleaned up and revolutionized. He cannot deny the fact, the reality of your transformation, your joy, your love, the peace that you have in your heart, the countenance of joy, a changed life. He cannot deny these things. He may stop his ears from hearing a preacher like me. He may refuse to hear the invitation of an evangelist. But somehow, skeptics are drawn to the human interest story of the steps that took you to the place of faith. That's why I encourage you over and over again, write out your testimony, how you came to to faith in Jesus Christ. Practice telling the story, your story of personal salvation. It's more appealing and appropriate for the lost than having them come here and hear a preacher on a Sunday morning. Okay, we're supposed to go out and tell people. Work on your personal testimony. That's why I gave you tools, examples in the back of the auditorium on how to write out your personal testimony, your story of salvation that others might hear. Right now, we witness this with, with Zacchaeus. You know, anybody who heard what he said there is like, what? This money worshiper is now giving away money? Something has changed. And it has. There's new management in his heart. The Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, that's his personal testimony, but then Jesus verifies it in verse 9 and 10 here. He says in verse 9, salvation has come to this house. For as much so as he is also a son of Abraham. Jesus is essentially saying, he is a saved man. Salvation is here. It's present. He plainly announces that salvation has come. And salvation did not come because Zacchaeus was a Jew and he was a descendant of Abraham. But Jesus says something here, a phrase, for so much as he also was a son of Abraham. His salvation wasn't because he was by bloodline a Jew. His salvation was because by faith, He was a son of Abraham. What does that mean? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him, accounted to Abraham as righteousness. When Abraham looked up at the stars and believed God's promise that one day a childless man in his 90s would have a child, as much as the the stars in the sky, Abraham believed God, and God credited it to him. He charged him, put this to his account, righteousness. He is now standing justified before God. He is standing just as if he has never sinned because of faith. And so here, Zacchaeus is the same as Abraham. He has exercised faith, and he's been saved. And in verse 10, all of Gospel of Luke, from Luke 1, from the proclamation, Mary, you're going to have a son. He's going to be a savior. He's going to save this people from his sin. All the stories, all the teaching, all the doctrine, all the miracles, all the, all the rebukes are leading up to this verse, verse 19, I mean 10, Luke 19, 10. This is the purpose of Luke's gospel. So you and I would understand Jesus came to seek and to save. And you all are recipients of that. And we should be thankful We should be gracious. This is the key verse of the gospel. In an answer, this is his answer to his critics. Why is he going to sit with these sinners? Because that's who I came to save. This was a fulfillment of every purpose of Christ's coming. He came to seek and to save the lost. You might say, what does lost mean? Okay, if you look back at Luke 15, remember when Jesus was accused again of eating with sinners? He said, let me tell you why I eat with sinners. And he gives them one parable with three aspects, three stories. Okay, remember the illustration I gave? There's a college professor or a preacher speaking at a college, and he asked the students there, he said, hey, what are the, what are the bit, top three ideas that are influencing our world today? One of the students raised his hand and said, uh, uh, evolution, Darwin. 
Man is an animal. The evangelist responds, okay, if you want to think man is an animal, let me tell you what a man is. He's a sheep. He's gone astray. He's away from the flock. He is helpless. He cannot defend himself. He cannot run from predators. There is a shepherd that will seek to save him. Next, next, next big movement, next big man that would change this world. Marx, Karl Marx, communism. Fine, if you want to believe that, that he's changed the world, guess what he believes? That, that man is just a token in the economy. In other words, he's a lost coin. He has the image of God stamped upon him. This lost coin on this woman's necklace cannot save itself. It cannot contribute to its own finding. The sheep is helpless, but this coin is hopeless. Okay, one more. Let's just say one more. What, what other influence has, has influenced our world? The response was Freud and his view of, of man, id, ego, superego. That in every man is an inner child. The evangelist says, fine, if you want to believe that, he's a prodigal son. He has rejected the family. He's left the fellowship and the security and the love. He is heedless. He doesn't take the counsel of his father. Okay. Yet, a child, a human being, can make a decision. Not like a coin. And he's not as helpless as a sheep. The prodigal son comes to the point where he comes to repentance. He says to himself, I have sinned against God and my father. I will arise and return. And even when he returns to his father, the father says, no, 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 you can't work your way back into my family. You're accepted by grace through faith. So why does he eat with lost sinners? Why does he sit with sinners? Because he sees them as lost, hidden treasures. Like a sheep that is lost, like the coin that is lost, like a prodigal son or sons that have been broken and separated from the love of God. They all need to return. They all need to be found. So the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now's a good time to review what it means to be saved. You know, in the case of salvation, you, you know, you understand loss now, right? Out of purpose, like a coin. Out of place, like a sheep. Out of home, like a, a, a prodigal son. But what does it mean to be saved? In the case of salvation, you have to place your trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. Realize that Jesus Christ is your only hope. There is no other. It's not Jesus plus good works. It's not Jesus plus my baptism. It's not Jesus plus church. It is Jesus Christ and him alone. This is what we see here in the story of Zacchaeus. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. But what does it mean to be saved? You know, R.C. Sproul in his book, Essential Truths of the Christian Faith, he said, you know what? The question of being saved is the supreme question of the Bible. From the very beginning in Genesis, that's a theme, a mega theme, the story, the salvation of mankind. The subject matter of the sacred scriptures is the subject of salvation. Jesus, even at his conception, in the womb of Mary, is announced as the Savior. So saviorhood and salvation, they go together. It's the role or the function of the Savior to save cannot be saved apart from him. Yet again, we ask, okay, fine, saved. If someone asks me, are you saved? I say, saved from what? The biblical meaning of salvation, it's broad, it's varied, but in the simplest form, the word to save means to be rescued from a dangerous or a threatening situation. That's the simplest meaning. You know, when Israel escaped the defeat at the hands of her enemies in battle, she said to be saved. When people recover from a life-threatening illness, they are said to be saved. When the harvest is rescued from blight or drought, the harvest is said to be saved. We use the word salvation in a similar way, right? 
a boxer gets punched, he falls to the ground, he cannot get up, there's only one way he could be saved. He has to be saved by the bell, right? Salvation means to be rescued from some calamity. But the Bible also uses the term salvation to be very specific, to refer to our ultimate redemption from the ultimate calamity. You know what you're saved from? You are saved from God. When a person is saved, he is saved from the judgment of God, the righteous wrath and the punishment of God. And here we see Jesus is the one who saves us from the wrath to come. The Bible clearly announces that one day there will be a day of judgment in which all human beings will be held accountable for how they live. They will stand before the tribunal or the judgment of God. For many, this day of the Lord will be a darkness, a day of darkness with no light whatsoever. It will be a day when God will pour out his wrath against the wicked and the unrepentant. It will be the ultimate holocaust. It will be the darkest hour. It will be the worst calamity in human history. And so to be delivered from God's wrath, which is going to come, and if you watch the events in our world, it's, again, it's just coming to a head. It's coming. The rescue operation Christ performs is at the cross and his heart is to seek and to save those who are lost if you were to read Luke 24 you don't have to turn here but Luke's rendition of the gospel great commission is this Jesus is speaking after his resurrection they can't tell that it's Jesus two disciples on the road to Emmaus I don't think they could recognize who he is because he's been scarred and beaten up from the from the Passion Week before his crucifixion. It says this in Luke 24, 46. And Jesus said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance, there's that key word, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. So repentance and forgiveness of sins is is to be preached in his name. You ask, what is repentance? Did you see what Zacchaeus did? Here's a picture of repentance. In 1 Thessalonians, verse 9 and 10, I'll read you what the Thessalonians did when they heard the gospel. It says this, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned from God, I mean, I'm sorry, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God, and to wait for his, his Son from heaven whom he's raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us, here it is, from the wrath to come. Okay, and uh, let me just point out a, a significant uh, detail there. You turned to God from sin. It wasn't that you turned from sin to God. You seek God first. And because you turn to God, you can turn from sin. That's repentance. It's clearly defined, clearly showed and demonstrated. If a man turns to the living and the true God, he's going to turn his back on his old ways. That's what Zacchaeus did. He turned to Jesus, and his old ways were back here. It's a radical change of mind, visibly demonstrated in a change of life. That's Zacchaeus. So unless a person rejects and renounces his false gods and his false religion and surrenders to Jesus Christ as Lord, he cannot be saved. He must repent and believe. And the evidence of their repentance, both the Thessalonians and Zacchaeus, was that they served God and were waiting for Jesus' return. That's an evidence of true salvation. This is the fruit of true repentance and faith. This is why we always see in Bible examples, people who repented had lives that were changed and visibly changed. So we see here at the end, as I wrap this up, Zacchaeus was lost, but the Son of Man found him. He was perishing. That's an, a, a picture of the word lost. He was perishing, but Jesus saved him. 
He was lost, but he was found by Jesus. The seeking sinner, the seeking Savior, will meet. Zacchaeus was a new man with a new life and a new beginning. And remember, again, when the disciple says, how can rich men be saved? Jesus said in Luke 18, 27, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. He was a rich man, and ordinarily a man who trusts in riches cannot enter into the kingdom of God. But here, Jesus shows us, demonstrates to us the power of God in seeking and saving the lost. He turned from his love of money to love of God and people. And the truth is, Jesus' mission should be our mission. You might ask, why did Jesus single out this man? I think it's just to demonstrate. With men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. We see Jesus stepping boldly into Zacchaeus' life. Jesus not only invited himself to this tax collector's home, he hardly gave the man time to think about it. Come down. Get down. I'm coming to your house today. The truth is somebody in here might be in that tree. Somebody in here knows the pursuit of riches is empty. Somebody in here is in that tree knowing that the pleasures of this life is empty. Somebody here is in that tree knowing judgment is coming. Jesus told Zacchaeus to make haste. Do not wait. Act now. Today is the day of salvation. You know, the love of God, it's daring and it's courageous. If you've heard of Jesus' invitation today, today is your day to repent and believe. But to those who are saved, let me just say this. Jesus is an example for us to initiate friendship, to make contact with those who don't know Jesus, who are still in darkness. Let me encourage you, offer your friendship, especially to your neighbor, to those in your own household. Offer your friendship. Cultivate a listening ear and a caring heart. Ask them, do you want to know how I came to faith? Let me tell you. Ask them, hey, have you ever... Do you, know, you understand now as more in this, the whole thing about communism, BLM, about, about the constant social unrest? It's coming to a head. Churches are now being closed by BLM members, or at least trying to be closing them down or distracting their services. Do you want to know why it's so important that we as Christians stand? Let me first of all help you understand that why am I Christian. Let me secondly show you how to become a Christian. And from there, we pray that whoever that is would turn to God from their old way of life. They repent and believe. Take the initiative. It's there. It's available. And you'll be surprised at how many people are wondering about these things. Thinking about eternal life. Thinking about where our nation is going. Thinking about where our nation has been and how we got here. Look, do you have Zacchaeus' attitude? As the piano plays here, please bow with me. And let me ask you questions that you can answer in your own heart and mind. Do you have Zacchaeus' attitude? Are you eager to position yourself to listen to Jesus? And are you willing to repent and turn to God from your ways? Is the crowd in your way? It may be family. It may be your business. It may be culture. Is someone blocking you? or resisting your pursuit 
of God. You know that there's something missing. Let me exhort you, come to Jesus, make haste, don't delay. Pray this prayer in your heart. God, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. Forgive me. And the best that I know how, I put my trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. I believe that He died for me, that He was buried and that He rose again. If that is you, if you know you need to come down from that tree, and if you prayed that prayer in your heart, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if that was you, say, Pastor, that was me. Let me raise my hand to show you that was me. If that was you, if you prayed a prayer like that, you say, Pastor, that was me. Raise your hand. I want you to know, Pastor, I'm turning to God from idols to trust Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us your purpose on earth to seek and to save the lost. If Jesus dedicated three years of his public life and ministry to do that, we can give of our time as well. Help us, Lord, to join in the Great Commission to seek and to save the lost. For I pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Hey, listen, thank you so much for coming today. Consider all that Jesus did to come into your life and to save you. Think about it throughout the week. Pray for one person to share it with. Just pray for one person to share it with. And let me know how that goes. All right, this time, uh, don't forget that we have the 530 uh, graduation recognition service. And um, just be prayerful about giving your testimony and, and entering in to seeking and to saving the lost. Rice. after the service up here. That is not just for those that are in the music ministry currently, but those who are wanting to be or think that they can be. You're like, well, there's much more qualified people. Don't worry. The Bible says make a joyful noise, not a joyful melody. So we need you, okay? So come after the service next week down on the front. God bless you all.